about historical pigments, and um, the images on this slide uh, really relate the uh, sort of the temporal period of which I'm looking, from Paleolithic to Egyptian tombs to um, art on paper to um, illuminated manuscripts to Mayan wall paintings and to a, a Renaissance painting. I'm, I'm interested through contemporary paintings also, and uh, I'll show you what I mean as we go along. So I'm a chemical engineer. Why would a chemical engineer be interested in this? Well, we have at my home uh, our own little art science rendezvous every evening. My wife is an artist. Okay? She's multimedia. She's experimental. She works uh, extensively with different you know, sort of combinations of materials. Frequently, they're incompatible, and they face separate, <laughs> and they lead to all sorts of interesting interfacial phenomena, some of which I can speculate the reasons for the interesting effect. Ten years ago, uh, we tore down our house, remodeled the house, out of the house for a year and a half, and after that experience, we decided we now had the compatibility to teach a class together. So, <laughs> for, for the last seven years, we have taught an introductory sophomore seminar at, at Stanford. There are a couple hundred of these courses, they're widely different, and, and the one that we teach um, is designed for sophomores, but freshmen through graduate students have uh, taken it, and it's, it's been well received. In what department? It's chemical engineering. It's, it's actual credit in the engineering discipline, okay? It's a material science course, is what it is. Now, <coughs> this is what I don't do, okay? So I, I went to, uh, we've got a very broad library at home, and I went to one of the books on, on, in the materials section of our library, and, and I found this one on how to read an Italian Renaissance painting, and the sort of grayscale background here <coughs> indicates some of the words in, in the lexicon in, in this particular um, uh, volume. You may have seen it or seen ones like it. I grabbed some of the topics here, and, and they're in, in the, the, the bold uh, listings here. And so uh, from the point of view of art history, and many in here are much more uh, capable of talking even about this level uh, than I am, uh, there are a variety of things, and there's some uh, discussion on technique, but technique is really based upon understanding of composition, perspective, color use, for example. This is all visual, okay? Understandably. Here's how I look at a painting. It's from the viewpoint of material science, okay? And the background here, same kind of wallpaper, if you look at some of the individual terminology, these all come from our course. I should point out that our collaborator in the course is Susan Roberts Manganelli, who is the uh, conservator and exhibitions manager at the Cantor Art Museum at Stanford. And so we have all of our lessons in one of their teaching rooms, which allows us to go from um, one of the, um, let's say, studio labs that my wife Sarah teaches um, to the conservation studio and up into one of the Cantor galleries. And so the students can handle things, they can touch things, and, um, and it's a great experience. But what I'm interested in, uh, a wide variety of things, but they're materials, pigments. Pigments historically have come from all sorts of sources, some of them unusual, shellfish for example. You have to hold the pigments together with something, and um, historically these have included things uh, encaustic, which is basically a, a, a wax-like substance, hide glue, egg tempera, drying oil, acrylics, acrylics modern binder. And this combination of binder plus pigment, when it's put on a, a wall or a panel or a canvas, subject to a variety of different environmental stresses. Material science. These stress, strain, heat, humidity, and light uh, stressors can cause various effects to uh, this combination. And then it can be analyzed in, in a variety of, of ways. So here's how I look at a painting. Now, my wife is teaching me a little bit more about how to look at the 
surface of the painting and, and what it all means, uh, but I'd rather look inside. Okay? And if I look at a painting, um, and, and we look at other art objects, but let's say a painting, there's some sort of a support. That support could be rigid, wooden panel, plaster wall, metal sheet. It could be flexible, linen or, or cotton canvas. On top of that, there typically is a sizing that basically seals the, uh, the uh, support. If the support is, is um, uh, porous, like a wooden panel or even a plaster wall, or certainly uh, any of the fabrics here, uh, it prevents perhaps some of the binder from penetrating in and then losing adhesion. On top of that sized layer is a ground. The ground is very important. It's basically a sub-level support that, that provides additional stability for the really critical layer on top, which is the binder pigment combination. And this ground, here's, a, here's an example, cross-section of ground, this is an electron micrograph of this. And it's a layered structure. This is a true ground. This is made out of um, basically collagen with the little uh, lumps of stuff in here are calcium carbonate. And this provides um, uh, strength. And you can also put a, a pigment in it to give it a certain color. The ground is, in many cases, accessible by light from the exterior. If you've got transparent pigments, then the light can penetrate down in, reflect off the base, and the artist uses that in a, in a designed way to get certain effects. So grounds could be white, they could be brown, they could be green, they could be red. All sorts of grounds have been used, and that gives the overall visual effect. The paint layer, the mix, is a composite material, pigments plus binder, and then a varnish may or may not be used. Here's some cross-sections of uh, pigments. And, and here the point is that it's not one color. It's a whole layer. Now, the ones down at the bottom may, may be, in fact, the ground here. Let's now switch to the next pointer that I've got in the pocket here. So uh, it could be a brown ground and a variety of different colors. Artist has, um, in whatever technique that he's been using, built this up. Some of these layers may be transparent, and that would be intentional. Certainly, um, this is a common technique. So this is how I, look, how I look at a painting. It's a physical object. If I can get my students to understand that a painting is a physical object, and that there are interfacial interactions here, and stresses and strains influence that adhesion and influence that structure, then they can look around themselves and see everything is made of materials. You're sitting on materials, you're wearing materials, they have finite lifetimes and they depend upon the stress and strain. Painting's the same way. I have a mission in life. Uh, <laughs> these are paintings. These are all cave paintings. You probably have coffee table books that have some of them, Chauvet probably, Lascaux, probably, Altamira, I mean, perhaps not, but there are over 400 caves with paintings in Europe. There are ones in Australia, there's uh, others uh, around the world, and in, in this case, this one was discovered about 150 years ago. It's, it's one of the more recent ones here. These time spans are the ones over which um, human habit or habitation has uh, been um, uh, recorded. And these images have a, a fairly limited palette. Okay? So um, what is that palette? Well, palette is um, an earth pigment. Red ochre, yellow ochre. Uh, the different shades of ochre um, can go into the browns and, and fairly dark browns, the siennas and the umbers. And that's because of the addition of a particular um, mineral, okay, uh, manganese dioxide. Now, these oxides, ochres, siennas, and umbers are permanent colors. They're stable colors. And I've just arbitrarily called this a Paleolithic Earth palette just for purposes of taxonomy. Um, and you might have wondered this title, um, Historical Pigments, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and you may have thought I was just a Clint Eastwood fan, which I am. <laughs> Spaghetti Westerns rule. And, um, and so in case you have trouble following what is good and bad and ugly, here are labels. These are good. Why are they good? They're good because I'm not so sure I care about what color they are. I just want the color to stay the same. Okay? 
And, and, and these things are used in Paleolithic times, are used today. They're the most common pigment in any um, sort of collection. And so these are good. Follow that little label. Now, uh, one of the things about um, cave paintings and the Altamira and Lascaux and Chauvet is an issue of public access. Altamira was uh, open to the public for 100 years. And then it was closed because of the, the fluctuations associated with people walking in and out and breathing and temperature fluctuations. Uh, Lascaux was open for 15 years. And now there's a replica that maybe some of you have, have gone through. Chauvet has never been open, okay? There are a number of coffee table books uh, on Chauvet, but it's never been open. That's because people respire, and, and the fluctuation in humidity and the fluctuation in temperature in a confined space stresses the materials, okay? And, and eventually, with enough people, that's a problem. Well, how can you reduce that? How can you minimize that fluctuation? Well, you could seal it off. For example, an Egyptian funerary chamber, okay? Two, three thousand years, this is just fine. Or, if you're unlucky enough to be uh, downstream from uh, Vesuvius, then um, you can, at Pompeii, look now at um, rooms that were preserved because of that protection, okay? And the red wall here is, is one that, that, it's a cinnabar. Now, I, in, and again, in this taxonomy that I work with, I have an Egyptian palette and a Greco-Roman palette, and um, some of the pigments are natural minerals that are in these palettes. The Egyptian one has this really pretty nice yellow orpiment and a sort of red-orange realgar. Uh, the Greco-Roman one has a really great cinnabar, and uh, there actually was a cinnabar mine in South San Jose, in Almaden Valley. It's got a nice little museum there. And then red lead is another one. This symbol sort of stands for itself, right? Every one of these is poisonous, is toxic. Why? Why? What's the problem here? Heavy metals. Heavy metals, yeah. So we've got arsenic, arsenic, mercury, lead. And so if you look, if you look at the effects of heavy metals on, on almost anything, for example, cinnabar. Uh, mercury can cause you things like um, um, uh, locomotive uh, problems, uh, quivering, shaking, tremors, drooling, um, uh, migraines, and, and then on top of that you get depressed. Okay? So, so in the um, cinnabar mines that, that the, the Romans had, they uh, mined with um, slaves. In Spain, it was mined with convicts. The annual, or I should say, loss of uh, labor was 24% in Spain. Death from the, the mercury poison. Okay, these are bad. Good, <laughs> bad. <laughs> were they bad with the users? Bad for the users? Yeah. So the, the issue of, of use is, is, is a critical one. Um, every single um, sort of uh, handbook that I've seen with regard to working with art materials, don't lick your brush, okay? <laughs> There's a good reason for that. If you lick your brush, you've got a problem, okay? If, however, you grind your own paint, you grind your own pigments, and you wear a mask, and you work in a, in a ventilated area, it's controllable. In many of these things, um, if you have a binder that seals this effectively, then, then it's okay. So, so you can work with them. For example, you can work with them, okay, but you have to use caution. Now, another way to sort of seal uh, things away from the environment is to stick them in a book. Illuminated manuscripts would be an example. And so, um, and there are spectroscopic techniques to, to measure those. Now, here's some other ones. And if you look at, at malachite and, and azurite, I, I love azurite. And these things are, are chemical cousins. If you look at the chemical formula, maybe you don't do that very often, but that's copper, that's copper there, and that CuOH2 is the same in both, but this is one copper carbonate and then two of them, and, and just that difference creates this color difference, and so there's all sorts of good reasons why, but nevertheless, these are, these are chemical cousins, and I call them pretty good, 
pretty good because they're not toxic, but they will discolor. Okay? In this case, they'll discolor with sulfur, and sulfur turns them black. Now, the ancient Chinese palette had a malachite, an azurite, and then orpiment and cinnabar from the previous slide. Just with those four colors and black, many, many, many paintings were created. Okay, let's go to another one. Let's, as long as we're on the blue kick, and we've heard a little bit about blue earlier, a question about blue. Um, indigo. Here's the indigo plant. Here's the indigo dye. Indigo is a vat dye. This is a, a contemporary image of uh, a basically uh, indigo manufacturer in, in Japan. There's another plant that produces the same chemical compound, and that's woad. And woad has 1% of this active compound compared to the indigo. And these are actually uh, fabric that are dyed with woad. Now, I call this good. Over a billion pairs of Levi's just can't be wrong, right? <laughs> and, and so this is, this, is, this is good. Now, even better is to take the indigo, and that's this molecule right here, and stick it in a little cage. Turns out that the Mayan Indians figured out a way to make Mayan blue by taking a clay, it's called a Paligorskite clay, that's got little bitty sort of tunnels in it. Now normally these tunnels are full of water, but if you have a, a sort of a water mixture and you heat the thing up and you have the, the indigo leaves in, in the same pot, those indigo leaves, ex or the indigo molecules, exactly fit in the little tunnels and they displace the water. Now once this comes out, this is very, very resistant to heat because it's got this little inorganic cage surrounding it. Now another blue that, that has a, a, a really a, a, a great following and, and, a, and a wonderful history is uh, ultramarine, lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is, 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 a, is, a, is a rock, it's a collection of three minerals. Lazurite, which is the blue part, there's <coughs> iron sulfite, uh, which is uh, the sort of gold part, and there's calcite, which is the white. And Cennino Cennini, who um, was who prepared one of the original sort of craft um, technique books and um, from, from this time. These are his words. He's very flowery. He, he uses a whole bunch of words to say a few things, and he has uh, really comments on how to live your life and, and all of that. It's an interesting book in itself. But it wasn't exactly perfect because there's something called ultramarine sickness that, that appears even though this is uh, resistant to heat and light and, and, and um, uh, caustic liquids, acids do cause it to turn gray. So ultramarine was so expensive. It was obtained by hard rock mining up in the mountains in Afghanistan. There's only three mines in the world. The best one was all along the Silk Road. And uh, then it would be lugged out and, and then broken up in a, a, a detailed separation process that Cennini describes. Okay, you can get dyes from other things too, from insects. So for example, this is a prickly pear cactus. The white scum on there is a wild colony of cochineal scale insects. Uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, at the turn of the century, there, there was a, a scale insect that lived on the roots of this particular plant that, that produced a, a red type of dye. It, it looks sort of like this. But the, the Mexican cochineal really took over. And the way it took over was really interesting. Spanish um, um, conquistadors uh, found this when, when they were uh, basically um, uh, displacing the Aztecs. And, and, and they found this grain and took them along. They called it grain. It looked like grain. These are dried insects. They brought them back to Spain and Saxon. and it took about 50 years before the real truth that these were bugs, okay? Uh, but it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful dye. It's pretty good. Why is it pretty good? Because even, even though it's not toxic, and I, I should point out, this is pretty good. It's not toxic, but it does discolor, and, and this does fade. Okay, so uh, a quick comment on, on uh, sort of a material in the Renaissance time frame. The, um, these are, this is oil on panel, oak panel. And the key thing about oil paints is that this is a so-called drying oil. It doesn't dry at all. It undergoes a chemical reaction. It reacts with the air, reacts with oxygen in particular in the air. 
And so these little double lines here, these double bonds, basically lead to crosslinks and it attaches it all together. Now, I uh, heard about crackle, crackle a little, little earlier. And uh, in this case, I find this fascinating. My whole thesis, remember, is that uh, these are materials. Materials are subject to stresses and strains. What happens when you exceed the tensile stress of a particular material? It might break. And here's an example. And the interesting thing from this paper from Studies in Conservation, um, Bucklow has got a lot of published work, uh, is that the crackle pattern depends upon the substrate. And it depends upon the region of, of uh, where, where it came from because the technique was the same. In other words, the thickness of the ground, the nature of, of the, um, the, the, the paint combination. And so this crack pattern is different from this, is different from this, is different from this, and that you can use that for diagnostics. And it depends upon the failure pattern. I look at this and I see failure. A material failure, okay? But it's characteristic of the nature of the material. 1800s are a really bad time period for uh, pigments. Here's a whole list, 1801, um, in, in, in London, a particular uh, shop. And uh, these are watercolors. It doesn't matter what they're used for. That's just the binder. Only 20 of these were permanent or non-toxic, okay? Bad and ugly, okay? Now, a little bit later, uh, there are some um, other materials that you can tune the chemistry. In this case, uh, it's basically, a, these are semiconductors, cadmium-based, from a large band gap to a small band gap. Monet loved the yellow, and in this Art Institute of Chicago <coughs> survey, you can see a variety of other artists who have also. Cadmium is on the borderline of being a bad actor, okay? It's another heavy metal. It's, it's something for which you should pay attention. Um, eventually, it, there may be some restrictions. And my last slide is the following. Okay, contemporary pigments are largely molecules like this. If you go and you look at, uh, go to Windsor and Newton um, uh, paints, and you look at the nature, uh, look at the, the label on, on, on the paint, and it says PB4, okay, that's pigment blue four. And if you look at, you can look up on the Windsor and Newton uh, website, and they will tell you exactly what chemicals are in it. They won't say how much, okay? And they won't tell you what other sort of diluents and additives and other things they've thrown in there. But you know what the chemical is. And so right now, the aerolides or the Hansma, Hansa uh, pigments, they're earlier. Thalocyanines are this sort of um, uh, flat kind of structure with the copper in the center. And, and the quinacridones here with a bunch of places where you can hang other groups. You can tune these with, to different colors. These things are stable. These things have a high chroma. These things right now are dominating the market. So, thank you. <laughs>